my friends are since. As some of my faithful viewers may already be aware, I am not just an internationally renowned musician, I am also actually an incredibly talented photographer, and I know that it might be quite hard to understand how you can pack so much greatness into a single human being, but here we are, I am living proof of such a fact. Now unfortunately over the past few years I've been unable, or I guess I've had to deprive the world of my gifts, at least in the photographic sense, because the pandemic has meant that I haven't really been able to get out and about and take pictures and the way that I would like. However, recently with the borders opening up and allowing the free passage of persons across them again, at least to some extent, I managed to get a trip to New York uh, a couple of weeks ago and I spent about 12 days there, took a whole bunch of different photos and film. I thought it was about time that I tried to get back in the swing of things. So I took this wee beautiful camera. This is a Nikon S2. It's an old 35mm rangefinder. I got it just before or just after, I think, the pandemic kicked in so I've never really had a proper chance to play about with it. So this was the road test. Now I'm going to show you some of the photos that I've taken with it but I'm going to actually go through the development so you can see uh, what I'm doing because I'm also trying out a brand new film stock or at least a film stock that I've never used before and specifically I'm going to be using something called Kodak Double X. Now Kodak Double X is a black and white film. It is designed or it's at least used within the world of uh, filmmaking as in like for cinema stuff. Now I'm not a cinema a person. I don't really know much about it. However, this film stock has been used in famous titles such as um, Schindler's List, Saving Private Ryan, maybe quite a lot of films anyway. So this film has been road tested, it's still being used in that world. The cool thing about this is that you can buy this film in big reels from, you know, actual cinema companies and it comes in a canister like this. Now this is not a double X canister but it kind of looks similar and basically what you do is you cut up the film from here in a kind of dark bag with a bulk loader and you put it into your individual wee canisters that you shoot in your actual film camera and that way, in theory, it's should be a lot cheaper to shoot per roll than it would be if you're buying film in, you know, single rolls. Because nowadays film is incredibly expensive and I think by doing this I've managed to bring the cost per roll down to about £2 or something, which is actually pretty good. Anyway, I haven't actually tried this film yet. It is rated at ISO 200, but I'm going to push it to ISO 1600, which is quite a big jump, but apparently this film likes to be pushed and it looks particularly good, so I'll be the judge of that. Now the interesting thing about Kodak XX in particular is that with lots of cinema films, including this one, which is Kodak 500T. There is an additional Remjet layer on the film, which I think is to help the film go through the, you know, the cinema spools or whatever without getting scratched. And, you know, it's kind of like a lubricant or a protection layer or something like that. I don't really know. But the point is that layer is not usually present when you are shooting consumer commercial film in your normal cameras. And so you usually have to remove it and it's a bit of a pain in the arse to do. It's not a huge problem, but it is an, you know, an added step that you don't want to go through. Now the special thing about double X is that it doesn't have that layer so it means that in theory I can just develop this as normal. Now I've not developed film in about a year and a half if not longer than that so this could all go horribly wrong and I'm going to take you along with me for the journey. So this video is going to be very rough and ready because I can't be bothered filming it on anything proper. You can see here I've got my giant tank. This tank is a big old uh, 8 tank, I think, Super 8, uh, well not Super 8, it's an 8 reel tank, which means I can do 8 35mm films all at once. I've only got 7 in here at the moment, but it is a big bastard. Now I have preheated or added in a pre-wash, which is just water at the moment, and this is to bring the film up to temperature. Over here I have my uh, development solution, which is already mixed together. I've got my fix ready and uh, that basically should be it. Now the plan is I'm going to pour the water out here, I'm going to then pour in the developer, I have to then twisty twisty and mix everything together for a while. This particular film, because I'm going to be pushing it to ISO 1600, means or it requires 20 minutes in the bath, which is quite a long time, uh, but I've got my nice wee um, portable timer here. Now, in terms of developer, for those of you that are interested in that kind of thing, I'm using Kodak HC110, 
This is a very economical developer. It's been used by famous people fairly cheap if you calculate the usage ratio and everything. And it's, uh, yeah, that sh should be nice. You can probably see my spice rack in the background. Don't tell anybody that I do this in my kitchen. So this is meant to be at 20 degrees Celsius. It's at 21 and I'm gonna go with that because 21 is fine. Do -do -do -do. Our old flat had a much bigger kitchen, so this was much easier to do. You're meant to spin this for the first 30 seconds, I think. Or maybe it's the first 10 seconds. I've been doing this for so long, I can't actually remember. I just kinda do it by autopilot. And I'm gonna have to do this for 20 minutes, which is gonna be really fucking boring. But after that's done, I pour out the developer. I'll put in a stop bath, which is basically just water. I'm in Scotland, so I don't need to use a chemical stop bath or whatever. I'll then put in the fix, which is over here. I'll then do a final wash with uh, some kind of rinse aid, if I can find it. Yes, this thing, which is basically like fairy liquid, to be honest. And then I'm gonna hang it up and fucking uh, let it dry and scan it tomorrow. Here's a moment of truth. See if there's anything on these films. Whoa! Looks like there is! This is always the bit that I'm afraid of. I'll just pull out a brutal blank reel. But it looks like there's some stuff on there, maybe? So the next stage now that they've all been developed is to hang them up. Now usually what I do is hang them up in my studio. Uh, I use one of these, which is basically a sock. Uh, underwear peg holder thing for your uh, drying rack. However, it makes a wonderful film drying rack as well. Now I've got two of them here. I put it in the shower so that it can drip in there. And the way I remember which film is what for later documentation purposes is I put different colored pegs on the bottom of them. And that helps to not just straighten out the film whilst it's drying, but it also means I know what film is what and when I shot it where and all that kind of thing. So the way I keep track of everything is I've got my wee notebook here. I've got the date of development. I've got the film and the uh, place or whatever. You can see most of these are from New York. I've got the camera, the type of film and all that, the length of development. And then what I do is I just put the peg color in here so I can identify which film and which camera is what. Uh, the rest of these are all the same, so it doesn't really matter. They can be anything. Look at this, a thing of beauty. Well, kind of, ignore the toilet. Now I just have to let these dry, cut them down and scan them. And scanning takes fucking forever. It is one of my least favorite parts of the whole process, which is partly why I don't shoot film very often anymore. As if by magic we have now transported forward in time so that you aren't forced to sit through the laborious process of me scanning all of these individual frames. Now I'm going to talk through some of the results that I've got from the six or so rolls that I shot in New York and give you an idea of what the film looks like. I do have to apologise in advance because none of these pictures are particularly brilliant. However, uh, it is what it is. I've not shot film in a fucking long time so I am going to take whatever I can get. The sound of the shutter that you can hear as I go through each individual picture is the actual shutter sound from the Nikon S2 which I've recorded just to give this all a wee bit more added authenticity. The first picture that you can see here is from a street in New York. I have no idea where it was but I picked this one in particular as the first picture because it gives you a good idea or a good representation of the kind of tonality of this film when it's pushed to ISO 1600. You can see that it's quite contrasty. However, the thing that's important to note is that whenever you're scanning film it's not like when you take a digital picture and people say oh no filter applied or anything like that every step during the, the development and the scanning process means that you make choices so you choose how much light comes through the scanner in certain areas you choose the tonality in that process so it's very hard to get like just a straight read on a film so this outcome and actually all of the pictures I'm going to show you have been processed by me to look the way I like them to look or at least uh, look the way I like them to look within the limitations of the film and you know the tonality and all that kind of stuff that is available because obviously you can only push and pull things so much within the scanning software. I quite like this picture generally because it gives you a wee glimpse into uh, a New York street life. I like the guy in the middle. I like how it's kind of light on the left and then dark on the right with a wee you know glimpse of 
of a person in all white on the right. Again, not going to be an award-winning photograph. However, the next section that I want to show you is a screenshot of the process uh, from my scanning software. And this will hopefully give you an idea of the settings that I've used within Silverfast, which is the software I use. So you can see if you left things kind of default, what it might look like. Now, if you're not familiar with Silverfast, it is probably the best of a bad bunch of film scanning software. All film scanning software seems to look like it came from Windows 95 or something like that. Silverfast ugh, has this weird licensing model, but a few years ago I gave up and just decided to pay for it. And that, that's the weird thing. You have to pay per scanner. So if you buy a new scanner, you have to buy a new bloody license. But anyway, down the left hand side, you can see the different uh, kind of levels and curves and whatever that I've added. I've kept this fairly straightforward in the sense that the mid-tone level, the contrast level are both kind of in the middle and the actual exposure has been pulled back quite a bit. I would ignore Negafix, the vendor and the film type and everything. There's obviously no uh, listing there for this strange film that I'm shooting with. I found the HP 5 Plus uh, from Ilford on these settings with the X gives me the best balance between exposure and tonality. Now you'll note that the film is the wrong way around when I've scanned it in so I've flipped it over but also it's a wee bit flatter and that is kind of how it comes out. The uh, contrast that I've added in post-processing makes it look a bit better I think because it takes uh, the you know the darker areas and brings them down just slightly more so it looks a bit cleaner and crisper but this is just to demonstrate some of the difference between the shots and what they look like within the film scanning software. This next shot is uh, a guy who's holding a bike wheel, but it kind of helps illustrate how easily the highlights blow out in this film. I'd seen people talking about that a lot online. I had my doubts, but they are correct. This next image, again, is a good example of that. Maybe if I'd shot it at ISO 800 or something, it would have been a bit better since it was daylight. However, on the street, I like to shoot with a higher ISO so that I can shoot with a faster shutter speed. And the film in particular doesn't have any times available that I could find for HC 110 at ISO 800. So that was a problem. This next picture gives you an idea of the tonality that's available within the film because I kept reading everywhere that the film was so contrasty and blacks were really, really black. And that kind of gave me the impression that there wouldn't be much tonal range. However, on this picture of some bit of graffiti that I found in New York, you can see there is tonal range in there. And this is even with me pumping up the contrast a wee bit. For this next picture, there's a girl sitting outside an unmarked coffee shop. She's on her laptop, which I thought was one of the most New York things I could ever see, or at least modern New York things. So I grabbed her picture and she didn't notice. She was so engrossed in her Zoom call or whatever people do nowadays on their laptop outside. This next picture has some more contrast in it again, although this time I think it works because the guy in the forefront uh, who was literally just wandering up the road in this kind of, you know, this mishmash of, I don't know what he's pulling along there, but it was a really strange kind of uh, contradiction or, you know, juxtaposition of people who are obviously much less well off up against, you know, the Amazon Prime vans and the giant buildings and stuff. And I think that's one of the interesting and kind of uh, sad indictments of you know, American cities at this point. But uh, I'm not going to say anything else about politics, I guess. Oh, rats. Rats are everywhere in New York. I have never seen so many rats in my life. They were about the size of dogs. And I thought this uh, community bulletin board interpretation of that was pretty funny. And again, I'll pick this to show you deliberately because there is a nice tonal range even within quite a contrasty image, which uh, is particularly pleasing. This next one is of a couch or a seat in the street. And I've always got a weird fascination of indoor furniture being outdoors. And it was so hot when I was in New York, it was like 36 degrees Celsius or something, that one of the worst things I could imagine is sitting on a white leather seat out in the street. But hey, you know. For this next picture, this guy was way, like, I don't even know where to begin, but it was, they'd closed off a street and there was all these stalls. And this guy was, like, typing on some old typewriter, like a mechanical typewriter. And the girl was just sitting there looking at him in this weird, awkward setup. So I don't know whether he was, like, selling poems or, like, stories or whatever it might be. 
this guy's got the right idea. This was down, I think, the Lower East Side or West Village or something. I can't really remember. I don't know whether that's the same thing or not. Fuck knows. But there's lots of interesting people around that way. And this guy, he's not in a leather seat. He's not, you know, an idiot. He's out there, tap off, you know, enjoying the sun, trying to spread out. Although, for some reason, these benches have got the fucking metal rails in the middle. And I suspect that is probably an anti-homeless bit of architecture, which is really quite sad, actually. I quite like this picture. I like it because you can see the person sitting there on their phone uh, next to their crystal readings stand, which I don't know why I find that amusing, but I do. I wish that the tops of the fucking tent things weren't blown out. But again, that's kind of um, to be expected on a very sunny day with a high contrast film shooting at ISO 1600. For this picture, you can see there's a lot going on. We're in the same street where all of these stalls were. I always love it when people catch your eye when you're taking their picture, but they don't say anything or you don't realise they've caught your eye because it's not really like they've caught your eye. They're actually looking at me or the camera. Like, it's not a like a confrontation situation it's more just that they've taken an interest in you and the camera captures that even if they didn't intend you to realize that they were looking at you this is the kind of picture i wish i'd taken more of which was people in the streets doing kind of you know well just looking like interesting characters especially because it was so hot and i like the guy on the right because he's carrying this big case thing but unfortunately the shadows in this one are a bit darker than i would have liked because i would have liked it to be more obvious what he was carrying it kind of looks like he's holding on a, a car wheel or something there because of the way it's composed which is a shame but anything anyway this next one is a portrait. This is, well, a kind of candid portrait. This is a friend and colleague called Kristen. Uh, I really like this one because it shows you, you know, how good this film can look pushed to ISO 1600 because you've got the kind of grain on the left and the person's dark shirt, but it doesn't look horrible and chunky like you might expect it to for an ISO 200 film pushed to ISO 1600. And it's nice. It's just a nice, I like, I like a lot about this. I like portraits. Maybe I should just give up trying to take, you know, pictures in the street and do portraits more often. For this picture, I purely took this because it was of a French bulldog that kind of reminded me of my own dog. However, this was really weird because they had like a pen that was parked like on the pavement and it was like a free dog photo shoot uh, where you could take your dogs and get pictures of them, which is quite nice. I unfortunately had no dog to take a picture of, so that was very sad. This is one of the better pictures, I think, from my six rolls, which is a bit of a shame, really, because even this is not brilliant. But this was just on the street, that person clearly noticing me taking the picture, the other person completely oblivious. Here we have some more very dull New York street things. I think that part of the reason I was taking photos of all of this stuff around New York was because I, I don't take photos in Glasgow very often because I feel like that it's really boring, like everyone's really boring. But when I go other places, the most kind of mundane things really interest me, like this drinking water sampling station. Like is, that's something that we just don't have in Scotland because our water is brilliant. But anyway, that's why I took a picture of this. Another candid portrait, this kind of thing. Well, this scenario is, uh, you know, something I really like, which is where somebody is posing for somebody taking a camera phone picture or something. And then I steal the picture, but from a different angle, because I think it's always, it gives a nice or an interesting insight into them or into, you know, people in general. But this is someone I work with uh, called Ainsley. And this was on our lunch break during work. We walked to Washington Square Park or is it Union Square Park? Oh, fuck knows. I can't remember. One thing that I really try to get out of the habit of doing is taking pictures from uh, behind because I think the, you know, it's a coward's way out really and also it isn't as interesting ever than the pictures from the front because then you see people's expressions and all that kind of thing. However, something about this one I like. I, I don't know why. I don't know what the composition is. I don't know whether it's the shadows or, you know, everybody holding hands and all that kind of stuff. I just like something about this. And I think that the contrasty nature of Double X works really well for this one. So um, even though it's from behind, which is, you know, not brilliant, I think in this case it might work. 
So this picture is a bit strange because it looks kind of unlevel, like the horizon looks not level, but it actually was or is. So it, I don't really know what's going on there, but it was this truck that had basically like a living room set up in it. It was like a glass front and I guess it was advertising their furniture or something. You can see someone on the other side of the street looking over, but I like the contrast of the truck in black and white against the kind of city background. So that's why that's there. Um, Again, not a fucking... It's not some kind of artistic masterpiece. Again, we have an example of where the contrast of this film works really nicely. This was a bit of graffiti that says, there is no scene, there never was. And regular viewers of this channel may understand why I took a picture of this because, well, actually, I didn't take a picture of this because of this, but later on, I put, the, you know, two and two together. This kind of sounds like the Johnny Rotten sample that I used in a recent video, eh, a bit of music, take no scene, there is no scene. So if you haven't listened to that, go, go do it now. Well, not now, in a few minutes, once you've watched the rest of this rambling video. One of the reasons I hate being a photographer is that you have to be conspicuous. And even if, you know, even if you are inconspicuous, then it feels like you're conspicuous and doing something weird. And I guess that image is not helped by hanging over a fence in a park where people are sunbathing to get a picture of some guy reading a book. This guy was amazing. There was a band playing, which I think were called In Circles. They were some punk band. They were playing open air in the park. Had a good crowd. Sounded really good. And this guy, I couldn't tell if he was part of the band or not. But he was like stood off kind of on the quote unquote stage. And he was just rocking out the whole time. Like some old hippie rocker guy. Fag in his mouth. Fag in his other hand. Big stick thing. Just brilliant. And I wish I got a bit of a better picture than him. The, you know, the shadows are a bit too dark to make it out. But what? What a guy. That's who I want to be. That's who I want to be in maybe, I guess it would be like 10 years because I feel like I'm old as fuck at this point. For this next picture, this isn't really the picture that I meant to take. Like, I kind of wanted to take a picture of the eye up on the the wall there. But I ended up getting a picture with this couple in front of it. And I kind of like the contrast, especially because the highlights, again, have been blown out in this fucking film. But uh, yeah, I kind of like how this came out. Again, another coward's picture because I'm from the rear. I really need to get back into taking pictures properly so that I don't do that. But in my defense, to be fair, I was shooting with the Ricoh GR uh, Mark III for most of the trip which is a digital camera much more discreet and i took a lot of pictures with that that were a lot better from the front moving on to the final photograph in this selection and i think this is one of my favorite photos and i don't really know why but i love the texture on the left of the building and the bricks and all of the kind of pasted up you know uh, flyers and graffiti i like how the sign bore stands out or bowery i don't know how the, how the fuck to say that i like how that stands out i like how on the right it's all it's got the darkness of the street but then you've got this guy in the middle on this mobility scooter and then of course the lady with the big hair and the big sunglasses who just looks you know, incredibly fashionable and really interesting standing in the middle of it. So there's something about this I really like. Uh, I never, this is why I didn't go to art school or any crap like that. Well, one of the many reasons that I didn't go to art school, assuming that I would even ever get in, which I definitely would not. Because taking a photo, it should, you know, you shouldn't have to explain a photo. So I don't really know why I've done this video. Anyway, with that, that is my first selection of photographs from Double X. Kodak double X black and white ISO 200 film. I will definitely be using it again, although I think I'm going to try and shoot it at a lower ISO to see what it, you know, see how it performs and if it's a bit less contrasty. I guess it might perform better in Scotland in the grey scale weather and city that we have since um, there'll be a bit less harsh shadows and things. I will probably never do a video on this again. So, yes, goodbye.